Wait, what? I can do that? This is Eric Bell with Wait, What? Financial matters that matter for business and the people that own them. Welcome to this episode of Wait, What? Financial matters that matter. This is a special edition of Wait, What? Financial matters that matter. I'm fortunate to have a returning guest with me today, Dr. Stephanie Ardry, to discuss the next best steps around the tax relief plan approved by Congress and the president recently. COVID-19 has devastated many businesses, and I'm glad to see that a relief is on the way soon. Welcome aboard, Stephanie, again. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me back. You know, I'm not going to go into your credentials and your background that much, but just kind of cut to the chase so we can discuss, you know, what's best for business owners to do next. But let me say this. Early on, Stephanie did an episode about corporate credit and made some important distinctions between corporate credit and your personal credit and why business owners should need corporate credit or should establish corporate credit. Now, Stephanie, your company is called Blue Diamond Capital. Can you give the audience some some highlights in regards to your company and let us know who your primary client is? Yes, absolutely. So I work with a number of uh, small to mid-sized organizations that typically are looking for uh, commercial funding. And so when we talk about commercial funding, we're talking about uh, term loans, uh, loans for if you have, for example, a space that you needed to do tenant improvements, you moved into a new space, you need to do tenant improvement build out. If you need equipment financing, um, if you need corporate credit cards, those types of things all fall into that bucket. Uh, And, you know, mixes of those types of products are all in that bucket of commercial finance. And so we assist clients with, I say, we deal with their capital. Uh, There are clients that we represent who are looking for various spaces, leasing spaces. So we do a lot of tenant rep type transactions. And then the last bucket, we help clients who are looking to buy or sell their businesses. And so, you know, all three tend to overlap because if you have a business usually um, or if you're trying to buy a business, you need financing to purchase that business or that business is located in some type of space. So clients that I'm speaking to right now, primarily they're looking for finance. What kind of finance options are available? Secondarily, there are some clients that need to renegotiate leases. They need to see if they can get a reduction in the lease or some clients need to expand their operations. So they're looking to get new spaces at reduced rates because you know there's an opportunity and leverage to negotiate in the market. So those are my two primary conversations that are happening at this particular time. But obviously today I'm happy to talk about uh, finance and the programs that are available. Can you give us a deeper dive in terms of what's available or Tell us what's available in terms of this this, uh, tax relief plan. Sure. So Congress passed a product that they're they're calling the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Program. Uh, The acronym is CARES. And basically, this act allowed them to allocate $350 billion to assist small businesses uh, to help them hopefully keep their existing workers, and also to help them address some of their immediate emergency needs. You know, several businesses have been completely shut down, so they're unable to continue with their regular operations. So there's a series of types of products that are available. Some of them are loans that are treated as grants. Some of them are loans which are providing extended payment terms. And so what's important is that depending upon which category you fall in, and I mean, this is is amazing. They're not only looking at small businesses with fewer than 500 employees. They're looking at 501c3s with fewer than 500 employees. An individual who operates as a sole proprietor is qualified. An individual that operates as an independent contractor is qualified. Um, An individual who is self-employed and maybe carries on in particular trades or businesses are qualified. Um, Some of the veteran organizations. So it's just a wide variety of folks who are qualified. So Stephanie, let me take a step back. You said grants, some are are given in in terms of in the form of a grant and also as loans. Can you make a distinction between the two for me? Yes. So if you receive a loan that's treated as a grant, then it means that you will not have to repay that amount. 
So it's issued and it's one of the options that SBA is making available for some of the, again, the smaller businesses with the objectives of getting those funds to those businesses as quickly as possible. And so those funds will not be repaid. Uh, for companies that need larger uh, loan amounts, those will be repaid, but they're repaid over a longer period of time. And usually they're designed to be at a more favorable interest rate. Okay. So what's the, I guess, I guess, I guess I'm wondering what's the max on the one that you don't have to pay back? So at the moment, what they're using as a max is $2 million. So up to $2 million is the maximum amount. And some of the um, like emergency economic grants, they are up to $10,000, which can be made available to small businesses and uh, nonprofits. And so what happens is typically what's beautiful is when there's some type of solution. The challenge is that because there's so many different layers to this, individuals really need to have an individual assessment to understand what they are qualified for, because it's going to basically depend upon different criteria. So you want to look holistically at the various programs and what you qualify for and what's going to get you the most immediate response. Because some loans say, well, if you already have a similar application for another product, then you can't qualify. So it's, you know, really going to be about having business owners speak to qualified professionals to help them understand the programs, but also which programs best suit their needs. Well, I know you're one of those qualified professionals, but tell me what a person who is qualified in helping someone assess what's best for them or where they help them get in where they can fit in. Who is that type of person that can help them do that for the most part? So typically commercial lenders, you know, direct lenders, brokers. And so as a commercial broker, I not only deal with um, SBA products, which I'm, I'm always dealing with SBA. I've been dealing with SBA products different in the past. Some of those products are administered by banks. So as a result of that, I have strong banking relationships. So again, these banks that issue commercial funds. And then there's all so a bucket of private lenders who have capital that they're making available, that they've been making available. And what I think is great news is that all of these particular sources so far are still lending. I've been getting daily updates from my bucket of private lenders still informing me that they have products and opportunities available. I have a few clients that, for example, I was working with a few banks on loans for them that back in November, December were put on hold because the banks were beginning to recognize the initial signs of moving into a recession. And so because of that oncoming cycle, they started becoming a little bit more conservative with making decisions. Then I received a call last week from the same bank saying, hey, we're trying to get as many loans placed as we can. So go back through your clients that you submitted and, you know, let's, I'm going to send you a new application, get, let's get them packaged and get them in. And I, so it's definitely the brokers, but I also spent a lot of time speaking right now with tax filing. So mm-hmm. the CPAs and tax professionals are working with their clients. So oftentimes this is an opportunity to look at how the clients are allocating their resources and if they would benefit from some type of restructuring, if they would benefit from some type of loan. And, you know, I'm seeing that I, it, one of my clients, for example, they're using a disproportionate amount of their cash flow to pay for things that really could better be handled by having a line of credit or some type of debt, because that would then free them up to have their cash flow for those items that typically, you know, when you're looking for capital to meet their payroll, you need to be liquid to meet your payroll. But your equipment, you don't need to use cash from operations to finance your equipment. Use some debt to take care of that. That'll improve upon your cash flow and give you the flexibility that you need in a time such as this. You know, I'm getting a flood of emails about use your home loan, get home loans, equity lines, personal loans, things of that sort. It seems like this is a by far better solution than using your home or some type of personal loan where you have to put up some type of collateral. Absolutely. I think that I would really say I would want to explore every opportunity I could to use my business as the resource to get the funding. If I can't get 
solutions that way. Only at that point would I consider my home, but I wouldn't want to have my home be the first asset that I commit. Now, we have to keep this in mind. That is the one thing that becomes tricky when in the past we've dealt with SBA. Typically, SBA serves as a guarantor. And so they step in to make the lender then comfortable in issuing the loan. So they'll provide a 90% guarantee. And in order for them to do that, if you have any assets, they absolutely are going to use those assets for collateral. But this is where sometimes entrepreneurs get in trouble because because the SBA is now over collateralizing what typically might be a small loan by using your house, you often need additional capital. Now you mm-hmm. have no other c- collateral available. So I've had to find clients sometimes a way of refinancing out of the SBA product so that they then can utilize other tools so that they have resources to meet the needs uh, of their growth. Because the idea is if you're growing your business, you should require more capital. Right. And the best time to look for that capital is before you need it. You can always get a loan when you don't need one. Absolutely. But that's when you yeah. go and get it because now you're not over the barrel. So you don't you don't look desperate, you know, and it, typically people operate just the opposite. Right. They suddenly call me in a panic and they need the funding next week. And it's like, oh, my goodness, I, you know, I wish I'm a miracle worker. You know, again, we take on those clients and we do our best to try to accommodate them. But I also tell them that, look, if you could give me a little longer lead time, which that really was my messaging before all of this hit. Hey, you're looking at your end of year results, your financial research results. You're looking at your financial statements. You're setting up your conversations with your CPA or your tax preparer to prepare for your tax filings. This is an excellent opportunity for us to take a look at how you've been allocating your resources and look to see if there are any opportunities that we can create. Because sometimes there's stuff that they've paid off, you know, equipment in the in that example. You're sitting on equipment that's depreciating or possibly that's been depreciated, but now you need to upgrade that equipment. So how about we look and see if we can do equipment financing and allow that equipment to be its own collateral. Don't use your house for something that you can have it serve as its own collateral. So this is not a one fits all type of solution. You need to kind of sit down, have a discovery meeting with someone, figure out what all your options are, and then from there pivot to the combination or the right right option for you is what I'm hearing. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the best approach is it really is understanding the unique situations that that business is facing and what it is is they want to accomplish. This is not an SBA loan. This is, this is something totally different. SBA would be something in in addition to this. Could you do both? Absolutely. When I do a discovery loan, a discovery meeting with a client, I really try to understand their business, not only their business at this moment, but where it is they're looking to go in their business. And then I recommend the right combination of financial solutions. You know, I say capital strategies to help them accomplish their objectives. So a client came to me and he says, look, I would like to grow my business because I want to be able to sell my business in five years. And so I said, okay, well, what would you like to net when you sell that business in five years? Well, I want to net somewhere around 5 million. Okay, you're doing right under a million right now. So, you know, I can basically reverse engineer a math formula that's going to mm-hmm. say, okay, well, then you need to grow. Where do we have opportunities to grow? Because when we're talking about growth, it's a couple opportunities. It's either I have a group of customers, I need those customers to spend more, or I need to get a new group of customers. So, you know, the growth formula is, is really simple, right? But then do I have capacity to support that growth. Mm, If you are limited in capacity, then that means you need to expand your team. That means your payroll might need to grow. So then you need additional capital to finance that additional payroll. So you see it all sort of goes together. And so I Mm -hmm. think that's really the unique uh, approach that we offer at Blue Diamond Capital. Blue Diamond Capital and Blue Diamond Advisory that really just works on developing those strategies and business plans. Of course, you know my history. I came from a background where I was an expert 
consulting to Fortune 500 companies and developing strategies. And so that company, I grew to $250 million joint venture. So I know a little bit of something about strategy and, you know, dealing with customers. So, uh, right. you know, so, yeah. You know, is, are there any limitations or what can this money be spent on? Is there, can it only be spent on specific things? And do you have to use, show proof of funds? I mean, uh, proof of how your, what your expenditures are going to be. How does that work in terms of this money? So for some of the programs, they are asking, they want to see what particular expenses you have if you're going to be able to address payroll. So again, because they've included sole proprietors, obviously a sole proprietor is not typically going to have a payroll, but maybe they have outside consultants or outside uh, resource providers that they're using. So it's going to be, let's take a look and see what you have. And mm-hmm. what your expenses are? Are you are you supporting a lease that you have? And and what are those requirements? What are the requirements to keep your business in business? And then mm-hmm. also to provide you with some type of bridge. But mostly, it's looking at what's going to help you stay afloat in business. So again, if you're an independent contractor, you're selling your talents. And if the person that you're typically or the organization that you're selling those talents to now has a moratorium on your talents, then what you need is to be reimbursed in a way that will c- cover your livelihood. So you're then going to use those resources to pay your own personal living expenses, because that's typically what you would ge- glean from y- being an independent contractor. And so at this moment, you're not able to fulfill that. So it looks like from the paperwork that I've reviewed that, yes, you need to have some kind of scenario that shows where you've been, what type of earnings you've had for a couple of the programs, they want you to demonstrate what your last year earnings were. So for like a commercial brokerage, I would have to provide my tax returns or at least my year in financial statements to show what my earnings would have been. And then probably a portion of that is what would qualify for funding for a period of time. So it sounds like it's very important that you apply for this money the right way the first time versus just Absolutely. trying to fill an application sending in if you don't have the proper documentation and backup uh you're just kind of not <laughs> you're definitely setting yourself up for for failure not success if you don't send in a complete package not only that because if your package has is rejected or put in a hold in pattern remember our entire country is impacted right now so how far down in the stack do you fall if you fail to get it and correctly initially, you know, if you can, right. So the objective is let's go through and see if we meet all the objectives at the first attempt. So we're somewhere earlier in the queue because we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know, are there going to be limits or will this program be fully committed? Will 350 million be completely absorbed by the organizations and you find yourself at the low end on the stick because you missed something along the way. So, so just, check all the boxes. Know, absolutely. Avoid yeah, those, yeah. those things. You know, sometimes people make simple mistakes that if you have a second set of eyes assisting you, you know, I had client scenarios, client, I had a client pre-approved for a $50,000 credit line for her company. And the lender took a look at her Dun and Bradstreet. She had zero trade credit. So they're saying, well, we can't really treat this like a business because she doesn't have established. That goes back to our other conversation about corporate credit. So instead, she couldn't get the $50,000 line that she was otherwise qualified for, but she ended up with a $9,000, you know, uh, credit card. So Mm -hmm. 50,000 to 9,000, that's a significant difference. Let me ask you, so back to corporate credit, if someone has not established corporate credit, they have a business. Could that adversely affect them getting money from this from on this tax relief bill? It looks like they're going to grant exceptions mostly at this okay. time, but under normal conditions, it it does because the, all the loan uh, you know organizations and the the lenders will say yes. We take a look at the DMB before we make our final decision. And so that informs to us how active the business really is in terms of conducting business. Because typically, if you're operating a business, you have needs, you have materials, you have different things. And so it would be normal to establish some type of trade relationships. 
you know, I'm kind of confused. I heard something about they were giving out checks to individuals based on their family and number of children. That's something totally different than this. Can you qualify for both or does one, if you go, for, I mean, that check is automatically coming to you, my understanding, if you met certain income uh, requirements. Yes. Now that is based on um, your household, your individual tax filings. and. Okay. I understood that they were going to be looking at um, 2018 tax returns to make those determinations. And then that on your household is more based on employees in the sense of you had a job Mm -hmm. and because of your job, you now are facing unemployment or you're laid off temporarily. And so we need to get you some resources so you can maintain your household. But then separate from those individual solutions, now we're talking about, but if you own or operate some type of business and your business falls in these various categories, then here are some particular solutions which may be available to assist you as you maintain your business. I guess what I'm wondering is if if you're an entrepreneur, you just started out, and let's say your income because you just started out is below your 2018 is below the criteria and you do qualify for those funds on an individual basis, can you also apply for a loan for your business, a forgivable loan? So we'll have to look at that. Check? We'll have to look at that individually because there is a, a question that says, have you applied for a similar loan for mm-hmm. to solve this particular problem in your business? But the personal is not a loan. So your answer okay. in integrity is no, you haven't because you're not applying for a loan if you happen to qualify for, for some type of money to your household. That's mm-hmm. based on your individual filing. So even as a business owner, I'm getting an individual tax return and then there's a tax return for my entity. Okay. Right. Now, I know you're good, Stephanie, at looking at all the different angles and on different things like this. What are some of the pitfalls, additional pitfalls that you see that we have not discussed in regards to this, this tax relief program? Well, I think that we have to also realize that a lot of times when there's something passed at a legislative level, that there are a lot of details missing in terms of execution. So what we want to understand is that some of this is going to continue to be a little bit of a moving target because all of these departments that are now charged with implementing, you know, they're implementing from this, you know, 50,000 foot view. But do they have the systems in place to manage the demand in terms of how they're implementing these particular programs? So they have some ambitious targets for some of these. So if you get your application in by this time, we're going to turn it around and, you know, a week or three days. I saw something that say three days and I'm like, that would be a miracle. (laughs) I've not seen the government turn anything around in three days. (laughs) Unless unless you owe them money, they'll turn it around in three days. They're not going to turn it around if they're trying to give you money. You know, but but if, but if they can make it happen, definitely more power to us all, right? Because right. the sooner we have the resources, the sooner we can mitigate uh, some of the particular risks that we're facing, you know, as mm-hmm. organizations and as individuals. So, you know, hopefully we can, you know, keep our economy uh, on foot, on target for some type of recovery and it won't be overly extended. But in addition to these particular programs, I also um, encourage entrepreneurs to look Inc. did, Inc. Magazine published a great list of additional tools that other Fortune 500 organizations are making available. So, for example, different companies have been offering both ad credits and grants. Amazon launched a grant program um, specifically focused on businesses in and around the Seattle area. Facebook created a small business grants program Uh, there when it first was released. uh, It wasn't fully populated yet with all of the details, but, you know, check that out. That's coming up. Um, GoFundMe is offering different type of programs and the opportunity for others who have resources to be able to make those resources available to support businesses. So there's a number. Yelp is offering advertising credits. Google has some kind. So there's just a bunch of resources. And I think what I've really 
been focusing on is not only having my regular conversations with my various lenders, private lenders who have funds available, but also really taking a deeper dive in terms of these programs and making sure that as many of the entrepreneurs that I can reach, uh, I can make aware of so that they can look and deploy these various tools to help their businesses survive this time. You know, one of the things I've seen in times of crisis, there's those people out there who will take advantage of folks. And I'm trying to figure out how, how would the business owner who knows his plumbing business, like the back of his hand, how could he determine who's real in terms of helping him out before he writes a check or does something to, to, you know, get these people working for him? How does he really know who to trust and who not to trust? Is there anything that you can give us in terms of questions he should ask or what he should look at or credentials or anything of that sort? Absolutely. I've seen this already as I've seen people sending out SBA and loan information and they Mm -hmm. are asking for a broker's fee and they're not a broker. So the first thing is, is if you're providing brokerage, you should have a license. We hold a license, a California state license to do brokerage. So, you know, start there because you just want to make sure that the people are qualified and this is their business. You know, this is not something that I just woke up and said, oh, this is an opportunity. Let me send out an email. This is something that I've been working with clients, you know, since 2012 and really before, but definitely specifically around the commercial financing, you know, Uh, brokerage and business brokerage. Blue Diamond Capital was launched in 2012 in order to be a solutions provider in that particular space. And so, you know, this is what we do. So California license, does that allow you to work with people in other states or how does that work? So as it relates to specific brokerage in terms of products? No, I'm licensed in the state of California. So if I'm dealing with, for example, private lenders and charging a broker fee, you need to be a client based in California. However, if I'm providing you with advisory services, which is why I indicated that there's a second company that I have, Blue Diamond Advisory, if I'm helping you to put together your strategy, I can help you uh, globally and internationally because that's not the, the same license. I don't need a broker's license to have that expertise. Then you'd look at my credentials. I'm a doctor of business administration, a DBA. You know, a lot of times people hear about MBAs, MBAs, MBAs. Well, I'm a step above an MBA. I'm a DBA. So I'm a doctor of business administration. So it says that I have the highest level possible of business knowledge. And not only do I have that as a credential, I have over 30 years experience as both either an entrepreneur or a corporate executive. So those are my credentials that qualify me to provide those types of solutions. So for this for this uh, money that's being available or made available by the federal government, would you be doing this under your advisory? Um Hood so, your so for, for yes, as it relates to their advisory needs, yes, because one thing about the SBA is if there is a fee, SBA wants to know because typically SBA does not pay a broker's fee, so mm-hmm. that is a fee that has to be negotiated separately with the client. And so to the degree that the client is able to operate independently, I have been giving just free direction, go here and look up the information. But when a client is more in a system of, I really need your assistance to help Mm -hmm. make sure that we go through this process, then at that point, then I discuss with the client an engagement so that I can assist them specifically on their packaging. Well, how much would something like this cost? So it's really, it's on a case. I don't want to hold you to a price, but a a ballpark. It's on a case by case basis. You know, Mm -hmm. my objective at this time is to try to help clients accomplish their goals. My philosophy has always been I'm a fan of the entrepreneur. So I've always kind of focused on being in a in a pricing strategy that makes sense for the business, makes sense for them, makes sense for me, so that hopefully we can build a sustainable long-term relationship. And that's really what's been allowing me to win is I have clients that feel like, you know, they know that I'm, you know, giving them the absolute best and I'm committed to their success and I'm mm-hmm. not nickel and diming them every time we need to have a conversation. But, you know, collectively, we sort of come up with something that makes sense for each of us. You know, the financial package that you would have to submit to qualify for this, some entrepreneurs don't have their books 100%. Do you advise them on what 
what additional things they may need to qualify and, and how does that work for you or work with them and you? Yes. So I have some um, experts that specialize both in bookkeeping and especially using uh, QuickBooks and those types of tools. And so typically Mm -hmm. I will work with one of those experts. In fact, we're doing some work. I'm working with one expert right now who's assisting a client that was looking to raise capital. I'm updating that client's uh, business plan because some of the investors were like, we're not going to invest any money until we see an actual business plan. We need more than your deck. So I'm putting together that client's business plan, but I'm also in conversation with the finance professor professional to get the books in order so that we can really make clear projections, forecasts based on understanding where that business actually is. And so, yes, I'm completely involved in those conversations. And then I have another client that had to um, amend some tax returns because there were some mistakes that had not been caught by Mm -hmm. their tax professional. And when we were submitting that package for a loan, the bank said, hey, we can't, this is not going to work. You can't show that you only made $5 and expect to qualify for a $200,000 loan. (laughs) That math doesn't work. (laughs) So, you know, we kind of have to go back and revisit. So it's those kinds of things that I'm able to really help someone try to minimize some of the delays and steps, but give them a clear assessment of what they need to look like on paper. Um, And sometimes it's just things where it turns out that, the client really had higher net profit, but some things were just not uh, allocated correctly in their chart of accounts. There was a mistake and nobody caught it um, until we caught it because we were really trying to make sure. Because two things, I don't want to see a client also take on more debt than they can properly sustain. Yeah, because why? You know, now you're setting yourself up to be vulnerable and create a possible fail. So I don't want to see you do that either. Well, I think everyone would want to qualify for the forgivable money if they can, but I know that's limited. So depending on the size of your organization, you may have, is it can you get forgivable and a combination of the one with the with the longer loan? With potentially. Terms? Yes, okay. potentially. Potentially, because you might need an immediate right now infusion while mm-hmm. you're applying for a longer term solution. And I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out. We kind of joked about the federal government right now. What does that mean? That's a relative term. And I don't, is that a month, you think? I mean, I know we don't know because it just came out. In reality, what it will be, is that a month or three weeks, two weeks? What do you think it might be a process? Well, I would be really excited if they're able to deliver some of these programs within the next week or two. Um, yeah. I think that would be amazing. Um, but I think I'm going to kind of set my expectations on an, on a typical you know, 30 to 45 day turnaround, I would love for to be proven wrong. Um, but I think just in terms of where I'm speaking with clients, usually when we're doing commercial funding, it's about 30 to 60 days, but I'm going to say, well, maybe, you know, we can get it into 30 to 45 days, you know, just with the back and forth. But again, it begins with how well we start. So one of the things that I do with a client is as soon as I take them on, I set them up on a portal that allows them to upload all of their information so that we are able to have access. And then I'm also able to get that information quickly to the various lenders. So we kind of create one master application, if you will. And so Mm -hmm. we know that we have everything that we need. And then I have the ability to discuss, I can discuss with, you know, multiple lenders at a time, also doing that in a way that I'm controlling it so that they're not having negative impacts on their personal credit score because some of the lenders will, some won't, some will, but if they're uh, done in Bradstreet, it's not fully developed, then now their personal credit comes into play. Uh, But if they're done in Bradstreet, it's fully developed, then their personal credit won't come into play at all. But, you know, any combination of the scenarios that I need, then I'm able to mitigate some of the damage of let's not have 10 different lenders pull your credit to then determine that they, you don't meet their loan qualification. That's right. my job. I mitigate all that beforehand. Okay. Okay. You know, how would people get hold of you? St- I mean, they can always call me at, at six. I'm going to leave that number, but how would someone get hold of you if they want, we're interested in using yeah. your firm? Sure. Our office is 949-258-4341. Again, okay. that's 949-258- Four three four one. 
And you can always get hold of Stephanie through me. And, and the office number is 714-643-2500. And my extension is 420. And I will forward any information I get or calls that I get on to you, Stephanie, so you can help these people out sooner than later. Are there Absolutely. any final thoughts or closing comments you have in regards to these programs? I know it's a moving target. Is there anything that you kind of leave, want to leave the listeners with? Yeah, I just want to tell entrepreneurs, you know, this too will pass. We will survive. We'll come out on the other side, probably as different organizations. We'll find out that we have new opportunities to deliver products or services via online methods that maybe we hadn't fully entertained. So use this time as an opportunity to really think strategically about what it is you want to accomplish. And I think take advantage of the resources being available with maybe lower thresholds and using and deploying that capital effectively so that you can realize some growth gains at the end of all of this. You know, I had a final question. I, I was wondering, I know knee-jerk reaction for some companies was to lay people off. And that's why we have such a high un- unemployment rate. If I understood it right, if you sustain your employees or keep them on board, there was a special credit or more money affordable to you if you did that. If, yes. those, people, if those people's knee-jerk reaction was to lay someone off, if they brought those people back, did they qualify? Yes, absolutely. Because many of the programs are really encouraging. One program in particular is saying, hey, we're going to give you a loan amount based on two times, two and a half times your average monthly payroll cost. So they're encouraging you to be, you know, be able to articulate what that illustrate what those payroll costs are. And we're really looking to give you an incentive to keep those employees. Okay, so that'd be an opportunity for people to to reduce the unemployment numbers that we're hearing so far. That'd be good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thanks for being with us, Stephanie. Uh, I know we're probably going to have to talk about this again after we get some results, talk about what the results are and talk about who you've helped. I appreciate you being with us. Oh, Eric, thank you so much. It's always my pleasure. Uh, Again, you know, however we can help, you know, that's the name of the game is I think that if we all pitch in and do our part, then we'll all come out better on the other side. Well, let me tell listeners, we're doing this through Squadcast. So Stephanie and I and Brian are keeping our social distance apart. Matter of fact, we're several miles apart, many miles apart from each other. So we're more than six feet apart. So I appreciate you doing this. Thanks, Brian, for for facilitating it for us. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie.